The Death of Marjorie Kimball, Chapter One Jerry struggled to get out of the taxi. Her stiff hip wasn't getting any better. As she slid herself out of the car, she could see the young driver taking his seatbelt off, a look of professional concern on his twenty-something face. I'm fine, I'm fine, she grumbled, as she slowly, too slowly, got to her feet. She fished in her purse and pulled out some money for the driver. As he drove off, she peered apprehensively into her canvas bag, wondering at the thin, plastic syringe that was wedged between her phone and tissues. She zipped the purse back up. Jerry took the flight of stone steps as briskly as she could. As she reached the main entrance, the opulence of the retirement home took her aback. She had expected it to be plush, but this was ridiculous. A white-gloved doorman held the door for her as she entered. His brilliant smile, long practised, did nothing for her. Those smiles hadn't worked on her since she was a girl. A beautiful, red-lipped Asian receptionist came to meet her. Mrs. J... Mrs. she corrected. Sorry, Ms. George. Mrs. Kimball will see you in the sunroom. Please follow me. Jerry followed, her height of six feet giving her an easy view over the small woman's head. She was led down a long corridor, heavy with the scent of polish and musty clothes. Too many paintings were hung upon the stately walls for Jerry to notice them. They passed a row of double doors that opened onto a large dining hall. A long table ran down the centre its white cloth dotted with the remains of an enormous feast. Kitchen staff were throwing half-eaten meals into a large bin heaped with half-gnawed sausages and limp toast. The receptionist smiled back at Jerry. Breakfast has just finished, a very popular meal with the residents. After several more corridors, they eventually arrived at a large sunroom. It was so hot, Jerry guessed the heating was on, even though the sun shone through the large windows, which looked out onto manicured lawns and trimmed hedges. Residents dotted the large room, some snoozing, others playing cards. They passed one particularly old woman having a makeover. A young man leaned over her, painting on a thick, black eyebrow. Her hair was a severe blonde and her skin porcelain white. Jerry looked away from the painted woman as if she were intruding on some perverse act. As they passed, an old man who had sunk deep into his armchair called out to the young receptionist. I'd like some tea, please. I've been waiting here an age. The receptionist smiled and answered perfectly. Of course, Mr. Johnson. One moment, please. I said tea! With another perfect smile, the receptionist moved on. Eventually they came to a table near a window overlooking a corner of the vast garden. Marjorie sat watching the idyllic scene, her hands clutching a teacup and hanky. Jerry spoke softly. Marjorie, dear. For a second, Marjorie didn't recognise her old friend, but soon enough, memory returned and she smiled. The receptionist pulled out a chair for Jerry. I'll leave both of you to it. Call me if you need anything. Thank you. Jerry watched the young woman walk away. Poor girl, she said to Marjorie with a sigh. Have you got it? Marjorie asked. Jerry breathed slowly. Marjorie, love, are you in such a hurry? Her old friend grimaced. I don't know, Jerry. I'm afraid I'll forget what I'm trying to do. Jerry reached out and held her hand. Is it getting that bad? I think so. It's difficult to say, 
I'm so sorry. How are you, Jerry? Jerry was silent and they both turned to stare out at the beautiful day. A resident was standing out on the lawn, an old woman rummaging in her white cardigan pocket. I've got it, and I'll give it to you. But are you, do you really have to ask, Jerry? Marjorie looked down at her hands and drew in a long, shuddering breath. While I still know it's me, I want, I will, make it my own way. They both watched as the old woman outside popped a hard-boiled sweet in her mouth, then discarded the silver wrapper on the billiard table lawn. Jerry heaved a sigh and Marjorie laughed a little. It's in my purse. This isn't the first time you've smuggled me some drugs, you know. I was just thinking the same thing in the taxi. They both smiled. Marjorie shuddered. What a terrible school that was. What were our parents thinking? I had a pretty good time, actually. You did, Marjorie smirked. You were hardly there towards the end, either in mind or body. It was true. Jerry had missed many school days, busy off at some rally or another in her bid to save the planet, while Marjorie, ever studious, worked hard to gain her grades for university. It was always so easy for you, she added. They had been inseparable, lives and souls entwined, unstoppable in their zest for life. School days were sometimes fractious, always Marjorie getting Jerry out of some scrape or another, covering up for her, making excuses. As Jerry became more militant, attending every protest and demonstration she could, so Marjorie studied harder. Each felt an inexplicable drive to pursue their own very different paths in adult life. Jerry had just turned 17 when she decided university wasn't for her. The counterculture movements had taken hold. There was so much to protest about. The rise in nuclear weapon testing, the Vietnam War, equal pay for women. Tens of thousands of protesters descended on Aldermaston, the atomic weapons research establishment. Jerry wore her CND t-shirt with pride and carried her banner high. Her family despaired, but knew there was no point in stopping her. She was driven by a force inside herself so strong, so compelling, she sometimes felt she was pushed along by some unseen force. Marjorie was always there to bail her out of one police station or another, her growing expertise in the law becoming a great help to Jerry in her campaigning. Then came Greenham. Jerry, now being paid to speak at protests and events, knew she had to join the hundreds of women in their fight. One day she squeezed herself, along with five other women, bags, tents and the dog, into her battered mini. I'm only going for the weekend, she told Marjorie, both knew this would not be the case. She arrived on a cold, wet evening to the sound of women chanting and dancing. Rhiannon Carius, Rhiannon Carius, rainbow banners adorned the nine camps. She left five years later, exhausted at the daily evictions and harassment by the local council and police and the regular arrests. Like many of the other women, she felt lethargic and unwell. Rumours were rife that the water was being poisoned and gases being released into the camp. So on a dull, wet day, Jerry packed the remains of her belongings, rolled up the white horse banner that had flown above her tent and caught a coach home. Marjorie, loyal and steadfast as ever, met her at the bus station. As they hugged each other, their two worlds intertwined once more, and Jerry found herself singing gently. Carry us over, crossing the threshold. 
From sleeping to waking, from birthing to dying, and over. What's that song? Marjorie asked. I've been riding the horse, Marge, she responded tiredly. You need a long bath and a few good meals. Marjorie laughed at the sight of her scrawny, bedraggled friend. You can stop trying to save the world for a bit. Come on, let me get you home. Jerry gratefully followed Marjorie to her car, unusually silent, like a long-lost dog, glad to be finally found. Chapter 2 Jerry wove her way through the crowded coffee shop, heading for the back room where there might be some seats. She could see an empty couch on the back wall, a waitress just clearing up after the last customers. As she got to the couch, the waitress was just turning with a tray stacked with cups, saucers and crumpled serviettes. Jerry knocked the tray as she passed, and one of the cups splashed cold latte onto her jacket. The waitress strained to regain her balance, and flustered, Jerry blurted, Watch what you're doing! Let me get a cloth, the waitress said as she put the tray down on the coffee table and hurried off. Jerry sank with a huff into the low couch. She fumbled in her purse for the phone, but paused. Did she really want to look at the news? She sat, quite still, hand in purse, staring at the opposite wall. It was papered with posters, some small, some large, abstract, impressionistic, biscuit box romantic, a real mix. She focused on a rather banal but sweet photograph of a white mare and her auburn foal standing in a sun-dappled meadow. It stirred something in her, a feeling, a memory, She drew in a slow breath as she smelled the hay and the wet earth after the rain. She felt herself beginning to smile sadly and stopped herself. Don't be silly now, she whispered to herself. But the recollection still came, effortless and persistent. Jerry was sixteen, wearing her old school uniform, a small bag of mushrooms in her satchel. Her older brother had given them to her with that cocky smile he seemed to always have. Just an innocent-looking brown paper bag with some musty-smelling, dried-out things in the bottom. She kind of knew what they were. Marjorie had dared her to eat some during break time. They had both ended up eating some in the girls' toilets, and then decided it was probably best not to go to class that afternoon. Instead, in a mushroom-induced psychedelic haze, they had wandered the wooded hills behind the school, finding wonder and an intense love of the sunshine and shadows of the woods. Enchanted by the light, they no longer followed the footpaths and were instead drawn into the thickets and wild meadows, filled with songbirds, flowers and small streams. The luminescence that emanated from within the leaves, flowers, grasses and water revealed the life force that exists in each and every living thing. They eventually stumbled across a farmer's yard and found themselves fearful they might be discovered. Then, startled by the sounds of laboured breathing and frightened whinnying, They watched as a farmer dragged a small brown foal from the stable, his large fist gripped tightly about the reins. The foal, only a few feet tall, was struggling with all its might. Its frantic mother, locked away in the stable, whinnied and stamped her feet. From the moment the foal had been dragged out, Jerry had tasted the sour metal of the bit in her own mouth and the tightness of the bridle about her face. The indignity of it burned as her body took on the pain the foal was feeling, mirroring perfectly its reactions. She rooted herself to the spot as she felt herself being dragged, defying the farmer with all she had. But with nostrils flaring and breathing shallow, 
She felt as though she was being heaved unceremoniously into the middle of the yard. The farmer stopped for a moment and caught sight of Jerry and Marjorie, not quite comprehending what he was looking at. But soon enough the farmer worked out why there was a pair of gawping teenagers in his yard. The girls, both barefoot and with leaf litter in their hair, stood just outside the gate, frozen by having been so suddenly faced with a hard reality. Playing true until we, well, I'll be phoning Mrs. Jennings right away. The girls, still frozen, stared mutely as the farmer yanked the foal forwards and hitched the reins to a nearby gate. As Jerry's head rang with the foal's distress, the farmer strode off into the farmhouse. Once the immediate threat had passed, Marjorie found herself drawn to the anguished mare, stomping and huffing in the stable. Before she knew it, she was in front of the tall white horse, drawing back the rough bolt on the stable door. Outside, Jerry was about to reach the foal, when suddenly the large mare almost knocked her to her feet, surging forward to protect her foal, neighing and shaking her head in anger. As her white mane flowed in the air, time began to slow for the girls. Seconds became eternity. With the calm confidence of the mind blown, Jerry lowered her head and let the mare sniff nervously at the top of her head. She slowly lifted her hand and placed it gently on the mare's muzzle. To Marjorie, who was watching from the stable door, it appeared as if Jerry was bowing before some great queen. At the bottom of her humble bow, Jerry reached under the mare's neck and then hitched the foal's reins, releasing it. As Jerry came back up, the white mare and auburn foal both watched her, as still as painted images. As Marjorie walked across the paddock, she noticed how the sun glistened off the coats of the mare and the foal. It had the same intense luminescence that she had seen earlier that day, emanating from the leaves in the forest. Jerry stood, now just a bit to the side of the mare, and looked directly into her eye, while holding her hand against the frightened mare's chest, feeling her rapid heartbeat. Marjorie came up along the other side of the mare, humming softly and slowly smoothing her hand along the mare's neck. Her hand found its resting place and sank into the thick coat at the hollow of the mare's neck, just in front of the shoulder. As she stood there, Holding direct eye contact with the mare, the foal sidled up against Marjorie. The foal moved into the sphere of its mother's protection. Marjorie's arm draped over the foal's neck and rested at the same spot as her other hand was on the mare. Jerry placed her hand on top of Marjorie's, and the four beings created a conduit of energy that flowed freely between them. Without actually hearing it, both Jerry and Marjorie suddenly became aware of the voice of the mare speaking to them. She spoke of the ultimate love, mother love for offspring, and offspring love for mother which only mirrors the love shared by earth and creation, the love that is the Great Mother. And when you hear our hoofbeats on the earth, hear the heartbeat of life. She continued on, Carry the knowing with you. Let it lead you to your paths, separate yet the same. Let it remind you when you go through hardships as my foal has, as we all do, Hardships created by the heavy hand of human dominance. Know that there will be freedom won through perseverance and patience, and that will be the freedom through which you fulfil yourself. With that, 
The mare shook her head, ruffling her mane, and rousing her foal who ruffled its own mane in response. Time instantly moved faster again for Marjorie and Jerry, and knowing they only had a few moments until the farmer returned, they opened the paddock gate and watched as the two horses ran freely up and over the hill and into the misty forest, hearing the sound of their hoofbeats even after they were out of sight. Jerry could still hear Marjorie humming softly. What's that song? I don't know. It's the wind. We need to ride that wind out of here. This became their first foray into standing on behalf of the earth. Later that day, Marjorie had defended their actions to the headmaster. He was hurting that foal. Throughout the years, Jerry and Marjorie would remember this time as they each faced the ups and downs of their lives. They never had to speak of what happened. Whenever they needed to support one another or themselves, they would merely say, Ride the horse. I'm so sorry. Let me... The waitress said as she bent down to sponge Jerry's jacket with a cloth. Jerry, vacant, shook herself a little as time returned in one sudden tide. She could do little but watch the waitress wipe the hem of her jacket. Jerry finally managed a polite, Thank you. The waitress replied, You're welcome. I'll be with you in a minute. Then left Jerry to her thoughts. Chapter 3 As Jerry rode in the back of the taxi, she could hear Marjorie's words turning through her mind. You need to be here. I won't do this alone. Not that she was surprised. She had half expected that morning's phone call. She would probably have wanted the same thing herself. But Jerry wasn't sure what was most disconcerting, that it was really going to happen or that she was really going to be there. She hadn't doubted for one instance that she would be going, but this time her own willfulness frightened her more than a little. The taxi slowed, and once again she struggled out of the cab, her aching hip making her take Jesus' name softly in vain. As she turned to climb the stone steps of the grand old retirement home, she was too lost in her own spooling thoughts to see the slow trickle of mist flowing gently down one side of the steps. What finally caught her attention was the gentle whinnying coming from the top of the large portico. The long-coat doorman eased open the door for her, his smile somehow different this time. It touched her where it had never before, in the teenage heart of her, where everyone feels that fragile love. As she walked in, she found herself beaming like a young girl at the handsome doorman. Then she was still. She didn't know how it happened, but she had come to a halt just inside the large reception hall. Before her were four auburn foals standing in perfect symmetry, two in front and two behind, facing her, watching her, sniffing at the air, nostrils twitching. Then she saw the white, undulating blanket of mist, only a few inches from the ground, lapping at their hooves in the slow-moving air. Confused, Jerry was about to turn and leave when from the corner of her eye she saw the pretty receptionist, large red lips parted in a beautiful smile. Instead of the white receptionist's gown, she was wearing the most dazzling sari, a red bindi blessing her brow, and the blackest of nails wrapped gently about a large wooden staff. Jerry's eyes widened further when she saw the horse's skull that was perched on top of it, long flowing ribbons of red and white and black trailing down to the ground. The receptionist bowed her head slightly and said, Welcome. 
The receptionist walked forward to stand in the middle of the four foes, the tiny bells on her silk slippers jangling. After a quick look over her shoulder, she began to walk towards the long corridor, the young foals accompanying her, each step in unison, each keeping a perfect distance. Jerry was compelled to follow. But before she joined the strange procession, she glanced back quickly at the front door, checking to see if it was still there. She had no idea what was going on and she wanted to know if she could still get away. The doorman smiled back at her and bowed his head gracefully. The corridor seemed to be longer than she remembered. For a while she thought she was lagging behind and hurried to catch up but every time she tried to approach the receptionist and her entourage of little horses, she found the distance between them was always the same, no matter how steady their processional walk appeared to be. Every now and again, the receptionist would smile back at Jerry, the horse's skull she carried, swaying gently from side to side. The gentle jangling of the receptionist's slippers kept an easy rhythm as they walked on past the many hundreds of portraits that covered the long corridor walls. Eventually, after what seemed like forever, they passed the dining room. But instead of the half-finished breakfasts she had seen last time, the tables were instead bedecked with what appeared to be some fabulous harvest celebration. Enormous pumpkins and piles of grain and beans and lettuces and apples and small red berries were laid out like some giantess's wild feast. It brought a weird smile to Jerry's face to see such abundance, and she shook her head in disbelief as she walked on, following the horse skull procession. As they reached the large sunroom at the end of the corridor, Jerry saw that it was no longer filled with easy chairs, sofas and coffee tables. It had transformed into an enormous indoor arboretum. The glass roof seemed hundreds of feet in the air and crowded with tall pines and beeches. Ancient oaks and young birches were dotted amongst sequoia, ashes, bodhi, baobab, holly and whitethorn, fig trees, magnolias and Scots pine. Jerry had never seen so many different trees in one place, never mind indoors. Birds and animals called and hooted, chirruping frogs sat watching by long pools, and large dragonflies buzzed around the foliage. The receptionist and the foals stopped in the clearing just inside the arboretum. Where? What's going on? Jerry stammered. Please, said the receptionist, turning and coming gracefully towards her. Please carry this. She handed Jerry the wooden staff and its decorated horse's skull, placing it gently in her hands. As she took it, Jerry could feel its enormous weight and couldn't imagine how she could even hold it up, never mind carry it. I can't, she complained. You must, the receptionist responded. Jerry didn't know where she got the strength, but she held the strange object up high and gritted her teeth, lifting with all her might. Then she found herself at the centre of four foals, walking with staggering determination along a path deep into the strange forest, sweat breaking out across her straining body. Just as Jerry thought she might collapse, she could see another clearing in front of her. As they came from under the trees, she could see a large circular bed with four posts holding burning torches. In the middle of the bed, Marjorie was lying very still, her eyes closed. The receptionist appeared once more and gently took the horse skull staff from Jerry, and she sat on the bed and took Marjorie's hands in her own. Marjorie, love? Marjorie's eyes opened slowly, and she smiled when she saw Jerry peering down at her. 
You made it. I'm so glad. What's happening, Marjorie? What's going on? Do you like it? It's my dying wish. I don't understand, Jerry whispered. You don't need to, love. Marjorie whispered as she touched Jerry's cheek with a cold hand. Then Jerry saw it. On the other side of the bed there stood an enormous ancient yew. Its larger branches bowed down to the ground and new shoots poked up from its gnarled base. The great tree was split down the middle, a dark opening leading to its hollow insides. In the darkness within the giant tree, Jerry sensed a terrible grief, and it gripped her suddenly, squeezing her chest and causing a tear to roll down her cheek. Yes, Marjorie said, that's what you need. What? Jerry blurted, hurriedly wiping the tear away. Pay attention now. Marjorie said as she pushed herself up and swung her legs over the side of the bed. As Marjorie stood, the four foals came to them, nudging at Jerry's hands and sniffing playfully at Marjorie's white gown. Jerry saw small ribbons of red, white and black tied in Marjorie's hair and felt another wave of sadness wash across her. Marjorie began walking slowly towards the great yew, the darkness at its centre seeming to open wide for her. Jerry stood and wanted to say something, but her mouth was dry and no words came. Standing before the opening to the great tree, Marjorie turned briefly and smiled, then stepped into the shadows and was gone. Jerry stared after Marjorie, hoping the whole fantastical illusion would suddenly break. After a moment, the beautiful receptionist approached from the side and asked, Can I get you anything? A cup of tea, perhaps? 